It's a delight to have an award-winning newspaper reporter and editor on the podcast. He's a former journalist on a mission to help people listen more than they speak, ask better questions, and find common grounds together. He's an husband, father, author, marketer, and podcaster. How are you doing, Michael? I'm doing wonderful, Toby. Thank you so much for having me on. It is truly a pleasure and an honor, sir. Thank you so much for, for joining me today on this episode of Mirror Talk Podcast. And as I said before we start recording, I'm very delighted and looking forward to everything that you're going to teach me today in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, but before, before we start, um, can you share a bit about your life journey so far, like about your family, your life, you know, moving from a career in journalism to marketing and podcasting? Sure, absolutely. I, I, my family and I live in the Denver, Colorado area here in the States. And uh, we've lived here for, gosh, several, uh, I think almost six years now. We used to live in the Kansas City area uh, on the Kansas side. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, out of college, I got my degree in mass communications and journalism. I was actually uh, primarily a sports writer. And I went to work at a small daily newspaper in small town, Kansas, and was the sports editor there right out of college. And after I met my wife there and in that small town in Kansas, and we got married and we started talking about having a family and, and what that might look like, the hours of a journalist, when you want to start a family, they can, they can be pretty intense. And my wife and I were just kind of crossing each other she was coming home from work and I was going to work and it, it just wasn't really conducive to the way that we wanted to start and, and raise a family. So I left the journalism world. I went and worked at a tech company and that's how I kind of got my start. In, and eventually my path led to, I went from project manager to, uh, I jumped over to the sales side and eventually worked my way up through marketing. And so now I've led marketing teams at software companies for the last 10 years. However, the journalist never left me. And so that's where podcasting comes in. Uh, podcasting kind of scratches that itch for me that I, I love journalism. I love telling people stories. I love asking questions and just letting someone open up and listen and that I can help guide that conversation. So when I got into podcasting several years ago, it was primarily on the fitness side because I'm also a personal trainer. But now recently, I've started another podcast called The Follow-Up Question, where it's exactly that. I ask questions and I get out of people's way and let them tell their story. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that, that's awesome. I, I was checking out a picture of yours on your website for the um, follow-up podcast where I saw your family, your beautiful family. And I saw you love hiking, you love, you know, outdoor fitness. So I found out really amazing and really cool that, you know, yeah, m mountain biking, I guess also, right? Uh, you, you carry out that as not not mountain biking uh mountain climbing I, I love i love going up the really tall mountains here in colorado we've we call them 14ers they're over fourteen thousand feet in elevation yeah, and yeah. so i i hike up those uh, last year i actually took my son up hit up his for the first time so yeah we if if it's during the summer and it's a nice day on the weekends you can probably find us hi out hiking on a trail <laughs> wow that, that's amazing <laughs> that's so cool yeah. So I, as, a, as a former journalist, um, you have interviewed and spoken with, you know, professional athletes, coaches, CEOs, entrepreneurs, pilots, and adventurers. You've spoken with, you know, TV stars. You've spoken with actors, Olympians, doctors, <laughs> Harvard professors, and even best-selling authors. So with all of this experience, can you share with us what you've learned from all these various interviews and discussions? What I've learned, my goodness, I mean, across the board, Toby, it's been everyone has a unique story to tell. Like mm -hmm. no one's story. You cannot make assumptions about anyone. People will amaze you. And, and when we begin to make assumptions or we begin to think we know what someone is about without asking them to provide us their experience in their words, that's when we run into trouble. That's when we run into misunderstandings. And so whether... I'm speaking to an Olympian gold medalist or an entrepreneur who started a $50 million business or just, a, you know, a small town Kansas high school athlete. I did that plenty. Everyone has a story to tell and it's unique to them. Their experience and their, their experiences have helped shape 
their views, their opinions, their, their outlook on life. And the minute I start making assumptions about what I think I know about that person is the minute that I'm no longer doing my job as a journalist, as an interviewer. Uh, it, it's not my place to tell someone what their experience should or should not be. Mm-hmm. That, that above all else, man, is the absolute number one thing that I've learned. <laughs> wow. So, you know, when you are right at that moment, you know, speaking with these people, interviewing them, and they have, you know, different opinions, you know, they are talking from a different perspective as you have or, you, or different belief than you have. Um, how do you find it, you know, how, how do you, you know, in, um, you know, disagree with them in a very um, emotionally intelligent way? Or how do you find common grounds with them while having these, these discussions with them? First off, I, I, I try not to refute what they've said. Because again, um, it may be my opinion, but my opinion cannot negate their experience. They have experienced life and they've seen different things and they've they've gone through different things than I have. I, as a you know white middle aged male in America, have a very different background and experience than a black uh, inner city eighteen uh, year old. These days, like my experience these days, especially in the States, is is wildly, wildly different. So who am I to bring my opinion to the table and tell them that their experience doesn't align with mine? So when I when when I come up against that point where perhaps my opinion is being challenged by someone's experience or someone else's opinion. I've got to get inquisitive. I've got to start diving in and asking questions to understand, like, what do I not see? Because there's always something that I I don't see if I haven't asked the question. Again, if I go in making assumptions that I know what that person is going to say based on who I think they are, that's where misunderstandings come into play. That's where we get into arguments about anything and nothing at all. So uh, I start asking questions. I, I've got to get inquisitive. I, and some of the questions that I love to ask is, what, what is it in your life that has helped shape that belief? Why do you believe that way? Um, can you help me understand why you see things that way instead of this way? Just digging in and getting curious about that person in their life rather than an ideology that you may paint them in does that make sense yes it does so yeah. putting, away, putting away your own ideology and just listening to them and you know um trying to look at things from their own perspective but that, of course yeah, yeah but but that, that's that brings you know a little bit of challenge to myself or some other people how do i listen more than i speak how can i do that how can i listen effectively well and really you know understand what someone is trying to tell me or pass across to me to go back to my journalism days um you become an observer when when you become an observer of a situation or of a conversation it removes the pressure that you might feel to have to be an active participant in refuting that idea or or challenging that belief that's a lot of pressure that i think we all feel right now we all feel like we have to post the next comment on Instagram or Facebook to to really get the dig in. We all feel like we've got to get the last word in and and be heard and and have that little victory in our minds. But if you think about what a journalist's job is, it is to remove themselves. They don't want to be the story. The good journalists don't want to be the story. I should qualify that. The good (laughs) journalists don't want to be the story. They want to be the observer in the room. They want to be the one that picks up all the little details, the nuggets that uh, they see going on around them and begin to weave together the complete picture. Mm -hmm. So when you're in a conversation with someone and you think about what it would mean to be an observer, ask a question and then step back, remove yourself from the situation and look at their body language, Uh, hear the inflection and the emphasis on the words that they're saying, watch their eyes. Where do their eyes go? Do they do they fall? Or do they feel shame? Do they get 
Do they get narrow and they begin to feel rage? Um, do they look up and they're searching for answers because they don't necessarily, they've never had to articulate what it is they feel. When you become an observer of humans, it's so it, it's so freeing for you because you can step back and begin to paint the entirety of the picture. And it is, it's really hard. I, I fully, I fully admit to it. It's really hard, especially just in like everyday conversation with people, you know, or people you disagree with to not want to get your opinion in there. But, but if you can ask questions that get people to consider their own opinions, that's when you can begin to have a, a dialogue. You don't want to just ask questions on end ad nauseum and, and never actually participate in the conversation, yeah. but yeah. you've got to find a, a way to find common ground. They said something, they, they, they reflected on a particular experience mm -hmm. and then you can dive into that. You know, the, the issue, let's say of climate change, very divisive, very polarizing, but if we can ask questions to understand what would it mean for you, let's say, let's say I believe in climate change and somebody else doesn't believe in climate change. If I ask the question, what would it mean for you to actually admit that climate change is real? What, what, would, what are you afraid of or, or what would that actually mean for you personally if you admitted that climate change was real, that the, the evidence and the science was real and not something that you didn't believe? What would that look like for you? Or... I could say you and I are coming at this from very different, uh, very different uh, viewpoints, very different um, beliefs and perspectives. Mm -hmm. What if we landed here uh, and started our conversation here? Mm -hmm. We both care about having a beautiful world to raise our children in. Uh, we both care about uh, protecting the, the aspects of nature that, give us pause that bring awe. Like if you stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon or you, you find yourself lost in the woods, not technically lost, but if you find yourself in the woods yeah. and there's yeah. no sound around, but the rustling through the evergreen trees, we both enjoy that, right? We both love that. We both want to keep that precious we can build out from there. Long-winded answer to your question, Toby, but I think it all comes back to being an observer of humans rather than always feeling the pressure to be an active participant in the conversation. Mm, yes. So once you be ready to, you know, ask a question, pull back and just listen and observe. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about observing, you made mention of, you know, body language. Can you walk me through that a little bit? Like what am I meant to look at in the first thing while I'm having a conversation? Like yeah. for example, you made mention of you know, the eyes, what should I look out for in the body itself, the way they see it and, you know, the way they cross their legs. I've heard so many things and it's like, oof, too much science. Yeah. <laughs> can you walk to, from your experience, can you tell me, um, yeah, what to look out for? You know, I'm, I'm not a body language expert, but I can tell you the things that I've picked up on through many, many years of interviewing people. And it's harder to do, certainly like we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to watch the hands, Toby. Uh, um, you know, if, <laughs> yeah, your hands, if, if you're truly... Uh, if someone is open and, and willing to have a conversation, their hands are going to reflect that. Um, if they're willing to be vulnerable and, and actually have a discussion and they're not agitated or irritated, yeah. their palms are going to be, they're going to show you your, your, they are going to show you their palms most of the time. Okay. Not all the time, but most of the time. Yeah. If they're, mad, if they're angry, if they're getting irritated at you, if they're getting defensive, they're going to close in on themselves. They're going to cross their arms. They're going to um, fold their hands together and kind of form like a, a fist with the two. And they're going to place it in between, you know, perhaps their legs or, or right at their gut where they're feeling protected in that way. They're protecting themselves. They're protecting their, their most vital organs <laughs> because they feel perhaps in your line of questioning, perhaps in the way that you've, you've come on to them in your own body language and your own inflection, that, uh, that, they, that they are going to be attacked in this situation. So I, I really look at the hands. Mm -hmm. I look at the placement of, um, or, or just the, 
the torso itself is, are my shoulders rounded forward? Am I folding in on myself? Am I, am I scared? Am I nervous? Am I not feeling comfortable or am I open? Am I free? Am I relaxed? Are the shoulders dropped and I'm, I'm feeling safe. Even though I may feel vulnerable, I'm feeling safe to, to be open to this. Um, you know, it's, it's just kind of a state of agitation. I think we can all pick up on the mar markers of agitation versus the markers of, oh my gosh, uh, okay, I don't have to be on right now. I can just have a conversation. And, and it takes a lot to get someone there, no doubt. Hmm. It, it takes a lot. Wow. So is there a way to warm up, you know, warm up um, each other to get to that state? Or what's, what are the exercises you want us to do? Like, for example, we are, we're, in this, um, we're having this conversation right now. Um, yeah. Are there like some things I'm meant to do you know, to, warm, to warm us up to, you know, have a very wonderful and deep and, you know, effective conversation? Or we could just dive, it, dive into the conversation and warm up during the process of talking? I, I love warm up questions. Um, <laughs> you know, Toby, if I, if I were to start here with you, um, I'd say something like, Toby, um, what do you care most about? What are the things that just really like ignite your passion? Why did you start this podcast? I'd love to know. I, I truly am asking you the question, like, what are the things that ignite your passions, Toby? Oh, you want the right answer right now? <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay, yes. So I, I started this podcast, for example. I started this podcast because I have a passion for learning. I love to, you know, learn from different people who have experienced things in life. Like, you know, for example, you as a journalist, you, you've learned how to, you know, speak with people, have conversations with people. So, and things like that, I love to learn them, like, through learn life lessons, for example, life stories. I love to learn from people's, you know, mistakes, people's... Um, you know, um, opinions and to just have a wider perspective of life through and um, talking with different people of different walks of life. So that's why I started this podcast. Why is learning so important to you? Yes, because I, I believe um, learning is very important to everyone because um, we, we cannot know everything. One has to keep on improving on Israel knowledge. You have to keep on growing. And growth for me is very important. You have to, I don't want to remain at a particular point for the rest of my life. I want to always improve on what I've learned. I always want to unlearn um, the things I've learned before that are no longer serve me or no longer, uh, are no longer good for my, for, my, for my state of being or for my life. So I believe learning is important for me because I always want to improve. I always want to evolve. I always want to keep on moving. I want to be dynamic all the time. Yes. So that's why learning see, is important. Yeah. yeah. And, and see, I, I could dig into that all day, man. Like, <laughs> Why, why, why is, you know, the, the, who instilled that in you? Who are your motivations? Who are like, there are so many questions that come up in my head as I hear you and I see your body language. You're, you're leaning into the camera. You're getting excited about this. Uh, I, I can see it. I want to know, I want to know the background. I want to know the, the deep experiences that you've had that make learning and challenging your own beliefs important. Like there are so many ways we could go. Right. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, and, yeah. And so hopefully you're, you're kind of seeing that, but it is, it is a, um, it is an intentional thing mm. that you have to do. You have to intentionally make the decision. I'm going to pull myself out of this conversation of feeling like I have to respond to everything mm -hmm. and just ask a question, mm -hmm. not listening to respond, but listening to ask the next question so that I can get to the heart of what this person truly cares about. And I think that's the inspiration behind your, your podcast, right? The follow-up podcast. Yes. <laughs> so can, can you tell me about this podcast? And, and I'm turning the table around. <laughs> what was the inspiration behind this podcast? Why did you start this podcast? And um, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, there are... There's a lot of hurt, Toby, um, that we have suffered through as a collective not just in the last 12 to 18 months to four years, however far back you want to go, but there's a lot of generational hurt in so many different ways here in the United States, in our society, as, 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 a, as human beings, really. There's just so much generational hurt. And I just saw the problem trying to be solved with more yelling at each other. 
Like you better believe how I, I better believe. No, I'm not going to believe that you believe how I want to believe. And it's just, it never goes anywhere. That's all it is. You see it on cable news. You see it on social media, comment streams, you see it. And so we're in this, we begin to divide ourselves. We begin to create these echo chambers where we never hear any outside voices or outside opinions. We never challenge our beliefs. I just saw this more and more and more playing out. And I wanted to explore if there was a better way. I don't have all the answers of what this looks like. And it's a huge, audacious, really hairy, ugly, gross goal <laughs> like, of, of trying, to, trying to bring us together as people to find common ground so that we might better understand each other. I don't know how to do that. I know how I can maybe try and do that in my own life. But that's, what I, that's why I started the podcast is... I'm exploring this idea. I'm trying to be better at this on my own, in my own life with the, with the people that I come in contact with. Because I, because I too have had relationships splinter and crack and completely disintegrate because of exactly what I just said. I have an opinion, you have an opinion, and we're never going anywhere because all we're doing is yelling at each other. We're just spouting off opinions at each other. We're butting heads. And I, I want to be better than that. Like for me, I want to be better and I want to bring other. So I'm, that's what I'm exploring. The podcast is I'm exploring what that actually means. I don't have all the answers. I don't know if this is the right way. I have a theory and I want to bring you on. I want to bring you on that journey with me as I explore through interviewing people, through asking follow-up questions, how we can better understand each other as human beings and the things we care about most. Wow, that, that, that's really good. That's really amazing. Because we can, never know, we can never know everything and we can never have all the answers to everything. But in your, in your journey so far with this podcast, um, have you been able to you know, you know, find some answers or some common grounds with people or you know, change your opinion on, on different things or your um, different aspects of life? Um, I, I, the biggest thing that I think I've realized, and it, it's it's lately that this has come up is this, this is not going to be accomplished on online. Um, I'm, I'm realizing more and more and more my goal with this, my journey to explore this falls incredibly flat online on social media in particular, because if you think about the nature of social media, I, as somebody posting a comment or I, as somebody posting a, a caption on Instagram, yeah. I never get to see how that actually lands with someone like you and I are having a conversation right now and our videos turned on and, and I can see your head nod. I can see your eyes light up when I say something that you, you like, or you agree with, or that resonates. Um, if I said something challenging to you, I could see the eyes narrow. I could see the body pull back. Um, we can't do that on social media. And so we never, we can fling arrows of hate and judgment and bias and pain on social media and never see or feel the effects of where those arrows land. And that I am becoming more and more convinced is going to be the greatest hurdle for me and this show to actually helping us make any sort of a difference. Um, it, these conversations have to, at the very least, take place in long form, like a podcast. They have to take place online. If they're taking place online, they have to be where I can see you and, and see how my arrows land. Yeah. But, and I know it's really hard right now. <laughs> Ideally, these happen face to face. These conversations yeah. that are really hard and really uncomfortable, they have to happen face to face. True. And we have to be willing to step into that discomfort and, and be the one to, to kick it off, mm -hmm. um, to not just let our hurt feelings and our own pain and our own biases shut us off from having conversations that actually could be really helpful and healing and beneficial. I've learned that over and over again, but here recently, um, as I'm getting into perhaps some, some more topics that people that rub people the wrong way that may challenge a little bit, cause a little bit of friction in their mind. Mm -hmm. 
Um, those conversations can't happen online. Just simply put. Yeah. You have to sit down together in your room or through video call to talk about. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it's face to face. So you could just hug each other and say, oh, yeah, it's, it was not, no arms were meant in this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, you know, when having, when, when having this kind of, you know, very critical conversations, sometimes you don't agree at all. Sometimes you just disagree. And that's how it's supposed to be as in different opinion, opinions and yeah, no common ground at all. How do you, how do you do that, you know, in a very intelligent way, in a very, um, proper way. How do you disagree without, you know, having to fling the chairs across the room and you know, throw punches and yeah. <laughs> um, I love, I love to ask a great question, by the way, because it will happen. There will just be instances where we don't agree. We never will. Our experiences are just too vastly different and we don't understand each other and we can't find common ground. Yeah. I love asking the question, um, is there anything that would change your mind? Hmm. And if the answer is no, then it's, then it's, and I hesitate to use this term, but then it's a religion to them. It's elevated themselves, their opinion, their stance, their ideas elevated to the point where no amount of emotion, data, storytelling, facts, what have you, it will not change their mind. If that's the point where they're at, then you need to walk away from the conversation. You need to say, well, at the risk of I don't want to have this conversation at the risk of losing you as a friend, losing you as a family member, losing you as somebody I, I can rely on and trust and, and look to in other areas where we perhaps can find common ground. But this and this conversation, it need, we need to stop. There's, there's going to be no point in us going further. So asking that question, is there anything, and asking yourself that question too, You've got to ask yourself that question too. I'm arguing for something or I'm, I'm trying to make a point. Is there anything that this person could say that would change my mind? If not, you need to shut down the conversation because it's not going to go anywhere. It has become a religion to you. Again, I hesitate to use that word, but that's the closest thing that I can, I can parallel to it. And there's no point in going further. There just isn't. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioning that right now makes me think about, you know, I always hear things like, oh, be open to change, you know, always have a listening ear. Maybe you could, um, you know, change your mind or something like that, be ready to learn new things. So me having something like that as a religion um, in, in quotation mark and someone telling me something entirely different, how can I have an open mind or how can I, you know, have a listening ear to whatever um, that person is talking to, talking to me about and maybe take one or two things from it without being, you know, adamant to say, yeah, no, um, I don't believe in this. Just keep quiet. Let's forget about this topic. Yeah. Um, a couple, a couple guests that I'll refer to from my show, uh, I think really help in this situation, um, help you be open-minded. Um, Dr. Leanne Davy was on my show and she, um, she said facts don't solve fights. Uh, so, so, so often uh, when we're in a really contentious issue or we're in a, in a deep conversation about uh, some belief that we have, we so often try to bring facts to the table to try and, and suppress and press down the other person's argument. And, you know, I mentioned climate change earlier. You can bring up any topic. Uh, you can bring up uh, racial profiling in the police system or the, in the judicial system. You can bring up uh, po any sort of political belief, quite honestly. Um, but so we often try to bring facts into the argument. And an argument is nothing but an emotion, an emotional outburst, an emotional reaction or response to a stimulus. And so why would we try to meet emotion with facts? Because emo all emotions going to do is like, you don't understand me. You're trying to bring these facts in here and this is not what I care about. So finding common ground is to, to talk about what Dr. Leanne Davy brought to the show was get to what they care about. 
understand what the, what it is that they are afraid of, what it is that they care most about, what it is that they feel perhaps, um, or, or just flip it on yourself. What is it that you are afraid of? What is it that you care most about? And that's where you can begin to find the common ground. The other great piece of advice that I got from a guest on my show was um, ask, then recommend. Uh, that's from Stan Pearson. He was on my show. And his advice, if someone disagrees with you or if you disagree uh, with someone else, is to ask a question. Um, hey, what do, you, what do you think about this issue? Or, or what's most important to you on this issue or this topic? Listen to their answer and go, huh, can I recommend something? Can I recommend something to you to like, if I recommend you go check something out, will you do me the, do me a favor and, and read it and look at it. And then can we come back and have a conversation about it? I love your thoughts on it. Get them um, by saying, I, I'd love your thoughts on it. You are playing to the ego a little bit. You, you are setting the expectation that you want to hear from them, not that you're going to bludgeon them over the head with your thoughts and ideas. Yeah. And, yeah. and so you can turn that around to yourself. If there's an issue or a topic that you are really um, just invested in, you're deep in the weeds, you are adamant that your way is the right way. If you want to challenge your beliefs, ask a question that the quote unquote other side might ask of you. And then go find recommended resources to learn perhaps the different view or to understand the different view. And then find somebody to talk to about it. Don't just sit there and stew about it and come up with all the counter arguments in your head. It takes, man, an incredible level of self-awareness to do that. It's real hard. It's real uncomfortable. But I've always heard, and, and I can't remember who's, who I heard this from, if you can articulate the other side's viewpoint better than they can, you're good. Like that can, that can either change your mind or it can make your own arguments all the more stronger. If you can articulate all the different aspects and there's never just one or two aspects or, or two sides to an argument, there's never two sides to an argument. It's a multidimensional, multifaceted, multi-sided uh, uh, object. But if you can articulate all those other viewpoints better than the people who actually believe them, you're in a good spot. Yes, that's, I believe that too. So, and that also requires, as you said earlier, listening. You're just listening and, you know, look at the various aspects to what they are saying. Yeah. Try to understand, understand them. And if you still don't believe in what they are saying, yeah, put across your opinion or your, your argument and maybe ask them to read up something so that you could, sh they could share their thoughts on that material that they are reading or they will read. Yeah. yeah. And, and like I said, be open to that follow up conversation where you can begin mm -hmm. to ask, like, Okay, what did you what did you like about it? What did you not like about it? What did you agree with? What did you disagree with? Yes. And be open to having that conversation again where you genuinely get curious about what they thought. Yeah. But you know, in, in this kind of culture or the, in this day and age, we tend to be very, very sensitive, you know. Um, <laughs> we get we get maybe probably a little bit uh, we get annoyed easily with you know the kind of questions that have been asked or you know the kind of conversations that we have or some other people's opinion on things i think we call this like the, the cancel culture for example when someone says something opposite to your opinion you just cancel the person deletes off but um but when having conversations for example how can i ask the right questions or good questions that uh, will not offend you for example like i'm talking to you michael now and and how can I how can I have the, the skill set to be able to ask you questions that are very good um, or better questions without hurting your feelings or without you know making you um, uncomfortable? Great question. Um, there is so much power in the pause. Mm. When you take a moment and reflect on what you've just heard. And, and maybe have a little bit of awareness of how their words landed with you. I'm, I'm feeling really mad and upset right now. What do they say that makes me feel that way? I'm feeling really attacked right now. What do they say that makes me feel that way? And then pause, reflect on that, like feel that coursing through your body. There's nothing wrong. Like in the, 
there are no unwritten rules of conversation and argument and and debate that says you have to immediately respond to everything. Mm-hmm. Pause, take a moment, reflect, and then if it is something that truly hurt your feelings or is something that landed with you the wrong way, say it and don't say it as you S O B like you, I can't believe you just said that to me. You say that landed with me in a really uncomfortable way. What you just said doesn't sit right with me in my heart of hearts. And here's why. And explain that to them. Sometimes people because arguing is an emotional thing, sometimes sometimes people don't always think about what they say. <laughs> I think that's really clear, and and we are so we are so in this hunting mentality that we are trying to go for the kill shot all the time to where this person all of a sudden says, "Oh, you know what? You got me. You're right. I totally changed my view now." Does that ever happen? Does that ever happen? No, it does no, not. No, really. No. Yeah. You just keep on <laughs> so, fighting till, yeah. Exactly. You get hurt feelings. You want to leave. You you storm out of the room. Yeah. But yeah. if you take a moment and pause and and reflect, and you say, Toby, what you just said made me really uncomfortable, and here's why. Like, here's how I took that. Is that what you mean by that? Is that what you meant to do? you've got to be okay not having to feel like you you yourself have to return the kill shot uh cuz i think so many of us fire before we aim wow that sits with me rightly some of us mm. fire before we aim wow <laughs> yes <laughs> that, that's true i think mean, i'm just like a bit suspicious and suspicious right now because i'm reflecting on that yeah there are a lot of um you know times and questions when when you speak before you think actually i'm like oh yeah i should have thought a little bit before opening my mouth to say whatever i said yeah and, and take social media like you have even more of a chance to reflect and pause like i know we, we see a comment on instagram or we see a comment on facebook that we don't like and we immediately start typing up our response and our teeth are gritted and we're like oh, i'm gonna tell this person i'm gonna i'm gonna change the world with this one comment this this witty post that i'm gonna post right back to him mm. and just stop set your phone down walk away from it and ask yourself is it worth it does the world need to know what I think about this issue. And here's another thing. Do they deserve, does this person deserve that level of access to me? Put up some boundaries. That person, if you take the time to respond to them and, and fire off that, that kill shot, you're giving them a control, a level of control and ownership into your life that quite honestly, they don't deserve. They have not earned. There is no trust there. And so the only thing that it will do is polarize and tear people down. So guard yourself too. Like choosing to opt out of the conversation, choosing to not respond as well, especially online when we have the space to do that. We're not in a, we're not in a one-to-one conversation guards your heart guards your emotions go take a walk outside come back to it and say you know what i'm letting this go this is not worth my time this person does not deserve that level of access to my heart yes wow so you could just go outside and scream to the to the wild yeah scream at a pillow (laughs) (laughs) yeah exactly scream to the pillow yeah <laughs> wow yeah but that, that requires a lot of self-control i, I, I mm-hmm. see you just have to you know because at, at that moment when you are very hungry you just want to like explode you just want to <laughs> shoot shots and you, you have to be self you have to have that self-control to pull yourself back from the situation and look at it from outside before deciding to take any action at all yeah and the the person doesn't know you like <laughs> at the end of the day, that's that is um, that's so important for us to keep in mind. Like mm. this person doesn't know me; they don't know what they said. Mm. Yes, I may disagree with it, but they don't know. They have no possible way of knowing how those words landed on my heart. Mm. 
and it is not my responsibility and it is not their, uh, quite honestly, their, their right to get to know me in that way because we don't know each other. Like you and I have been on a conversation for 40 minutes now. There now is a level of rapport and, and, and growth there that has happened. But if I, if you were just somebody who randomly showed up in my Instagram comments, you don't, you don't get that. You don't know me. And I don't want to give you that level of access without a conversation like this. It does. It takes an incredible amount of, of um, guts to back off and say, not worth my time, but it's so kind to yourself to do so. Yes. Yes. And p- picking up from social media, you know, nowadays we have a lot of platforms and a lot of um, source of information and that also results, you know, fake news or, you know, um, if bad comment or evil, you know, bad, you just eat, um, poor content, I would say. Yeah. So, yeah. so what, what's, what's the state of, you know, journalism in, in this kind of era? And what do you think, where do you think we are going to from, from here? How do you think we can improve, you know, um, having fake news or bad quality of information on social media? Oh, gosh, uh, it's... It's bad. Um, and the, the biggest reason I think it's bad is because you have bad players, bad actors posing as journalists. Um, and, and unfortunately, they have the biggest platforms. So anyone can be their own platform right now. But you have major networks who are not doing their journalistic duty to remove themselves from the conversation and simply observe and and tell the narrative, report the story. Um, On the flip side, at the local level, you have people doing phenomenal journalism, phenomenal work. They are deeply invested in the craft and the, the mission of journalism to the point where at the local level, Uh, Journalists are often some of the most trusted people in their community. When I was a journalist uh, journalist at that newspaper in small town, Kansas, I'd put the level of trust of me above any of the politicians (laughs) that were in that town. Um, I'd I'd probably put it on this just a touch below like their church pastor because they saw my face. They saw me at they saw me at the grocery store. They saw me at um, sporting events. I talked with them. I I interacted with them. I partic- I went to the county fair with my wife. Like and they, and I said hi to them. Um, they the work being done at the local level is where journalism is suffering the most, and also where it's doing the most good. One thing that I would love to see journalism stop really at all levels is this this notion that journalists have to be uh have to editorialize that they have to you know you have the um opinion section in the newspaper where the editor board usually writes a a commentary on a big important issue of the day i've been a part of those i participated in those i've written a lot of those in my time as a journalist moving forward I honestly believe journalists, journalism's, uh, journalists and newspapers should stop that practice. Report the facts, report what you know, remove yourself out of the opinion, uh, the, the need to express an opinion because you begin to, there is so much, there's already so much feeling of bias and, and they're slanting the story towards, my, towards the side that I don't like why would you give them any further reason to do so uh, or to believe that by putting your opinion out there? I, as a journalist, you should never know my opinion about the story that I am covering. Never. You should never know the opinion of the editor whose job it is to edit my story on the story that I'm covering. You shouldn't know that. I should be as hum- as humanly possible, unbiased, and willing to be an ob- uh, an observer and report the facts and let the facts speak for themselves be transparent about how i got the facts be transparent and open about the totality of everything that i know and that i've observed 
and leave it at that. Now, I understand opinion pieces, uh, editorials from newspapers, they have been an integral part of journalism throughout its history. We're at a point in our history unlike any other, and it has to change. Same thing with newspapers endorsing candidates for public office. Stop. There should be no more of that. It is far, far too divisive, and you immediately disenfranchise and disengage with an enormous section of the population that doesn't agree with who you say you support. It has to stop. Journalists have to remove themselves out of the opinion, uh, out of the opinion space and into the observation space. They need to move into that more and more. CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, all these major networks, they're going to do their thing. They're going to be what they are. The true change happens local. The future is local. It happens local. We understand what's happening. We're more connected at the local level. Um, those networks, I wish, would just eat themselves and, and disintegrate like a black star in, and fold in onto themselves. They do us no good, and they're not journalists. They are not journalists. Um, they're entertainers. So, so, so the best way to do it is report the news and take yourself out of it. Don't share your opinion. Just make it as unbiased as possible um, when working with journalism. Yep, and, and be, be an open book. And Say open everything book. that you know. Everything that you've observed, <laughs> um, hide, hide nothing or leave nothing uh, out, n- nothing of, of consequence out um, that could, if it's found out later, taint your, the story, taint your, uh, the public's opinion of the story or their views of the story. You, journalists have to be better at saying and telling the full and complete picture of everything that they know and everything they, that they've observed. So I just want to switch on to switch the topic now to your amazing yeah. book on, on Amazon. Um the, the involved man, I guess is the title. Um, yeah. Yes. So I, I was reading through the I was reading through the, the information of the book on Amazon and there was something that, that stood out for me. And it you wrote, um, when a man is truly involved in the relationships that matter most, everyone benefits. So mm-hmm. can you can you talk to me about this book? What does it mean to be an involved man? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Toby, um, the book that I wrote, The Involved Man, I, again, you know, it's, it's my way of seeing an issue or a problem that I have no idea how to actually address it, but I'm going to do it in my way. And as a writer, like it was, it was my way. Um, society is, is lacking for good men. And the way that I see that manifesting itself is through men being okay pulling themselves out of the relationships that matter most and discarding them when they are no longer serving their own selfish needs they're pulling themselves men are pulling themselves out of marriages when it becomes too hard Uh, they are removing themselves from their children's lives when it becomes inconvenient they are quitting jobs or leaving jobs or leaving job doing jobs to the lesser of their ability to the detriment of their colleagues, their bosses, when they feel um, when they feel disrespected, real or imagined, um, and and to me, it all comes back to a lack of priority, a lack of prioritization in their lives. And so, in the book, I talk about how an involved man is guided by a prioritization hierarchy of purpose at the top purpose that your life is guided by some greater initiative than just yourself. For me, it happens to be my faith, uh, my my faith and my relationship with Jesus. Um, For many people, it, it can be a bunch of different things, but your purpose. My purpose is to live in selfless service to those around me, to those who I love. Below that, you've got people. You've got the people in your life, the relationships that matter most, your spouse, your fiance, your significant other, your partner, your children, your extended family, your friends, your colleagues, the stranger on the street. There's even a hierarchy within people, um, but that you pour into those relationships, you work the hardest at those relationships that mean the most to you. 
Below that, so you've got purpose, people, then you've got passions, the things that build your character, the things that fill you up, the things that give you joy. And, and I say build your character because that's really key. Like <laughs> um, going out and drinking and getting drunk every Friday night may give people a lot of joy <laughs> in that moment. Does it build their character? Yeah. Is is kind of the qualifier? No, it doesn't. You shake, you shook your head. No, it doesn't. Um, so I'm I'm talking about um, paying attention to your health and fitness and and exercising more. Um, I I talked about my one of my passions is climbing mountains. That the the strength and the fortitude and the stick to itiveness that it takes to get to the top of a fourteen thousand foot mountain builds character. Yeah. There are so many different ways that we can pour our passions into things that build building building um, furniture builds character you have so much that you have to think about and understand and know and 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 create that's that's passions and then the last is your profession what do you do to make a living is it good honorable honest work a man who is an involved man lives his life in that order purpose people passions profession and at any time if one of those gets out of order a man feels unbalanced he lives his life um, most likely selfishly. So if your job jumps above your passion, you feel not quite right. Like if your job becomes what you're about and the things that you love, the things that fill you up and grow your character. If, if my job didn't allow me to run to, to have this podcast, yeah. the follow-up question, I would suck. I would hate that. I would feel uncom- incomplete. I would feel unwhole yeah. If, yeah. if my job came above the people in my life, then you get into some real big, ugly issues, man. My book is an example or or a running storyline of all the times in my life where that's been the case. All the times I've messed up that I haven't lived with my life in that order of prioritization. And it's a call for guys to take my example and the ways that I tried to make it right and hopefully apply it to their own life. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that gives you, uh, that's a long winded answer, but <laughs> hopefully that gives you what you're looking for. <laughs> yes, exactly. As in, you, you really spoke to me because, you know, having that other priority, you know, having the purpose and having the um, people and having the, the passion and having the profession, having, having that installed in your mind or set in your mind um, helps you to avoid a lot of conflict or problems in life. Like yeah. and what you said resonated with me because um, I was having a conversation with a, fr- a good friend of mine one day and he was telling me your relationship with God is the most important thing. Then followed by your relationship with yourself, then comes the relationship with other people, just the way you said it too. Um, like loving God, love yourself, love your neighbors as yourself, love people also. Then your, you know, your, after, and after your passion also, what, what are you passionate about? What is your calling? What's the calling over your life? Then also your profession, what pays your bills, for example. Yeah. Right. But, Hopefully they all align. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, there's a little bit of, of difficulty or challenge there, in which, in which involves, you know, time. You know, you have this passion and you have your profession and you're combining both of them together. And then you have people above that. You know, sometimes your passion and people, no, your, sorry, your passion and your profession requires more time. And that steals from the time you have to spend with the people that matter most in your life. How, how do you do that? <laughs> I think I think we're real good at uh, not recognizing our blind spots. Hmm. Uh, if I sat back and think about, look, look, listen, I'm not the end all be all example, but I wake up at 5:30 in the morning. I work out and exercise every day. I come upstairs. I have my my gym in my my basement. Um, I come upstairs. I have breakfast. I I hang out with my family for a little bit. Then I kind of begin to start my day, open my emails. Um, I I work, I'm a full-time marketing director at a software company where I'm growing my team. I'm trying to grow a company uh, that's, that's not quite, it's, it's beyond startup stage, but not quite like fully fledged um, company. And uh, so I've got that. And then I've got, I'm a certified personal trainer and I coach guys on the side um, all around the world. 
uh, as an online coach. I have a podcast for that side of things. It's called Fit Dad, the Fit Dad Fitness Podcast. Um, and then I have my follow-up question podcast and I'm doing interviews for those and I'm investing time in, in that. I've written a book. Uh, I, I like to go out to eat and I like to go out on dates with my wife and I like to go climb mountains and I like all these things. And at the end of the day, if I sat back and thought about it, I can find areas in my life where I have even more time for the hours from eight o'clock at night to 10 o'clock at night when the kids are in bed and it's just me and my wife, usually I'm watching TV. Could I take an hour of that time and dedicate it to something else? Sure, I could. Do I want to because I have all the other things that I do? No, uh, I don't. I enjoy that time on the couch where I get to finally just breathe a little bit. But I think we're really good at uh, pointing at other people and saying, you have got it all figured out. I don't have any time in my day. And I understand everybody's situation is, is different. Um, I would just, I'd start by asking questions. How much TV do you watch? How much time do you spend on your phone? Uh, do you do you cook your own meals? Um, how much do you exercise? Uh, just so many different questions that I could begin to pry and pick at. And, and how do you spend your weekends? We have time. Not everyone has the exact same amount of time, depending on what they do. There's time there. And again, if your profession is causing you to over the long term, I understand like there are periods in life where our profession kind of takes precedent. I used to travel a lot and that took me away from a lot of things. But if, if it is a consistent thing, evaluate, like, is that truly what you want? Do you truly want to put your profession ahead of the people in your life and the things that you are most passionate about for the next 40 years? If it's not, if it's not something that you're willing to do, be creative, find something else like there. You do not, especially these days, have to be stuck like previous generations in one job, doing one thing for the rest of your life. It just is not the case anymore. And there's a lot of examples out there of, of how to get that done. Yes. Yes. Awesome. So we have this time and we have to make the opt an optimal use of it, like make the most of it. Look, ask questions, as you said. Um, yeah. Am I spending too much time on my phone? Do I have to reduce that so I can spend more time with my family? Or is my profession taking too much of my time? Do I like it at all? If I don't like it, I should look for another job instead. And yeah. yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Michael, for <laughs> everything I've able to learn from you. Is, is there, is, how can people get across you? you? You shared a lot already. And I'm sure there, there are listeners out there who want to get across to michael ashford and you know get more information maybe get on your fitness um program for example yeah. or <laughs> or yes or, the, or, or that uh, buy your book or you just speak with you to ask for more advice or questions that we could not cover during this um, conversation so how can they get, get across to you yeah um I'll, I'll give you the hub of everything right now i'm really invested in the follow-up question and my podcast and my show there so the hub of everything there is the follow-up question.com you can reach out to me there it's michael at the follow-up question.com if you want to email me. Um, and of course, it can be found anywhere you find your podcast. On the fitness side, it's fitdadfitness.com. So fitdadfitness.com is the hub of everything that I do there. The podcast is the Fit Dad Fitness podcast. And again, it's michael at fitdadfitness.com. So those two, uh, those two websites will get you everything that you want to know. Awesome. So I'll place the information in the show notes for this episode. So anyone yes. who's interested could just click on it or copy the link and get across to Michael. Thank you so much. Once anymore. Thank you so much for having me on. I, I greatly enjoyed this. This was fantastic. Yeah.